Uh, most of us would have heard that the UK is preparing for BIM use on all public works by 2016. So today we hope, John, that will tell us uh, about the current state and plans for BIM uh, in the UK and uh, give us some uh, food for thought for Ireland. Good morning. You can you can answer back. That's okay. <clears throat> right. How do we work this one? Right. Okay. Good. Um, well, I think th firstly, just thanks for the invite to be here. It's really good, and uh, um, I hope you find it useful. Uh, so I'll just carry on. No one. Um, as you'll know, change is coming to the industry, and uh, judging by what's outside, some of you guys are are really at the front of this. Um, how many people here, just a straw poll, how many people here are under the age of 25? <laughs> Very good. Very, did, you, did you feel any different when you got up this morning? Apart from the usual hangover and all that sort of stuff that goes on. No, okay. Well, actually, you guys should feel different. Because you will be the generation that really changes our industry. Uh, I'll put an apology up front. I'm giving a sort of uh, over the water UK perspective, but I, from what I've heard, there's a lot of similarities with the way the industry is going and BIMs being adopted. So the reality is, change is coming, but actually, for some people, change is already here. And uh, I'm hoping you'll get a flavour of that this morning. That's me. Um, Martin's actually given a very fulsome uh, description of me. Uh, probably a, a couple of recent things is I'm now uh, chair of the uh, network of Southeast uh, BIM Hub, uh, set up by the CIC to support, support the government strategy. And uh, my book on design management, the Design Manager's Handbook, was published just a couple of weeks ago. It's available on Amazon at 37.95 if you want to check it out. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, UK BIM, CIO BIM, and client BIM, uh, which is really more stakeholder BIM. Uh, you're going to get 90 minutes worth in 30 minutes, so I'm going to skate over some stuff, but you'll have the slides anyway. Uh, I always start with this because this is some resources. A lot of this stuff is free. Uh, the two main things I'm going to pull out here are... Uh, this is, in terms of UK strategy, this is the most important website. And if, you, if you're interested in how the uh, UK BIM initiative is developing, that is the place to go. There is tons of stuff on there now, which I'll explain to you later. It's all free. You can download all sorts of things which are really, really useful. And if you want to understand how the UK strategy is developing and growing and has been implemented, then this web website has got everything on it. Uh, the only other thing is, uh, in fact, I'll leave that at that. Uh, it's, th there's, there's lots of things there. Most of it's free, some of it you can invest in, but you, you'll have the slides anyway. Anybody remember their Commodore 64 computer? Hands up. Yes, very good, okay. Uh, Betamax tapes, eight track cassettes, yeah, but, but down here we get things like, uh, anybody remember when we really started to get the sort of World Wide Web? The World Wide Web? The World Wide Web. Email, I, I was involved in using some of the first email packages in the UK, some web development. But lately, Google, Facebook. Facebook, if it was a country, would be the third largest in the world. It has over a billion users. Facebook didn't exist uh, in 2004. So what this slide illustrates is how technological change has impacted on our society. And now we are, we are global traders of information on a scale that's unprecedented and unimaginable by my generation. I'm a baby boomer. 
Uh, a lot of you guys under 25 are Generation Y, Generation Z. Um, and uh, you'll see the impact of this. Uh, if you know anything about BIM, then you'll know what this, what these things are. If you don't know anything about BIM, then this will be really confusing. But don't worry about that. Uh, Seth Godin is a, is a commentator in the uh, United States. He's a marketeer. Uh, he publishes a blog, which is uh, available here. And he said a while ago, all the slow hedgehogs are dead. This is where Darwin comes in. Why are the slow hedgehogs dead? Because they weren't fast enough to get across the road in time. So in terms of BIM and in implementation of BIM, I believe we are in a Darwinian moment when uh, instead of trying to just do little things a bit better, our industry is making a step change. And it's a question of survival. You, know, you, you guys have contracted by 80% in the last five years, by the sounds of it, in terms of construction industry turnover. So how do you survive that sort of change? How do you get through this? Uh, if you go back to the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs ruled the earth, and then they were gone. In evolutionary terms, it was almost overnight. And I believe our industry, both sides of the water, is facing challenges on the same sort of scale. So, as Darwin said, it's not the strongest species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. And if you're familiar with, say, uh, what's happened in the UK recently, firms like Blockbuster, Blockbuster or HMV going to the wall, why did they go to the wall? Because they didn't keep up with the digital uh, impact of technology on their particular niche. So they were outdone by iTunes and MP3 downloads and all that sort of stuff. And basically, there's a digital tidal wave hitting our industry. And only people that go with that wave and learn to surf it will survive beyond the next couple of years. And I believe it's that serious. Because people, companies that embrace this technology will be more agile, They'll be fleet of foot, they'll be nimble, they can turn on a sixpence. But the, the big corporations, the big boys who refuse to take on this technology, they're like the oil tanker, and it takes time to turn that sort of oil tanker. And I see this already, you know, the bigger organizations trying to take on BIM, that, you know, you have to jump numerous hurdles to get it through committees, to get the CEO on board, to do all sorts of things, and they keep asking for, give us more numbers, give, prove the return on the investment, and all that crap. Meanwhile, SMEs and the one and two man practices and companies, they can embrace this technology, they just decide to do it. And they will outgun the big boys eventually. You can see it happening already. So you okay, Ben, brief overview. Um, it goes back, if you're interested, uh, great, if you're not, well, just go to sleep for the next couple of minutes. The, um, in fact, some of you may well already be asleep at the back, I don't know. <coughs> it goes back to the construction strategy issued in 2011. It's downloadable from the website. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, two main thrusts, reduce capital costs in the public sector by 20% and meet the carbon reduction commitment, uh, commitments under the Climate Change Act, which is an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. And there it is. And this is the Biz BIM report, again, available on the website. This, although this document was published about 18 months ago, this is the UK BIM strategy. And if you want to learn about the UK BIM strategy, read this document. It's not an easy read, but it's got everything in it. And all the, all the work streams and all the sorts of stuff that, 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 that are now happening come from this report. Uh, last year, the task group published a one-year on report. Already, in the first year, the first 12 months of the project, 279 million identified in savings. Now, that's not all due to BIM. It's also due to um, sort of things like lean procurement strategies and all, the, all sorts of other stuff. 
but BIM was mandated by the construction strategy. The 2016 target was set. But actually, interestingly, the Ministry of Justice, they brought level two target forward to the end of this year. And why have they done that? Because they did some of these sort of early uh, adopter projects, uh, one notable one being the prison, young offenders prison at Cook and Wood. It's a 20 million pound contract value. It was tendered as a BIM project and the tender responses from the contractors were uh, submitted as BIM data, BIM data sets and geometry and evaluated in a BIM environment by the client team. Uh, basically, uh, the contractor was appointed, which I think is in to serve, and they made something like over half a million pounds savings on the uh, contract value, and they've also identified something like 30% savings on the operational life of the facility by involving the FM operator in the design process using the BIM environment. The, the upshot of that is the, the Ministry of Justice liked this so much they brought the target forward and they're right now in the thick of implementing BIM in the public sector. There's other stuff here but we'll talk about it. So we had the, uh, what's called the big launch a couple of weeks back. Um, all this stuff is now on the government website. Uh, Probably, I don't have time to talk about all of this, so I'll just give you some, some highlights. Probably the, one of the big things is uh, government soft landings, which is about the Bisria soft landings process. Anybody heard of Bis soft landings? No, okay, you guys should really look it up. Um, the web link's on the resources slide. It's, it's about handover planning and commissioning and giving clients a good experience of an operational handover and how do you do that and how do you plan for it and how do you make it happen and basically government has now embraced that and brought that into a government soft landings process which again has got to be impl implemented on all public sector projects by 2016 uh, every project will have a, a, a GSL champion um, and basically that hooks into the uh, sitting alongside this, alongside a BIM strategy, there is a government digital information strategy which hooks into GSL. So basically the government task group are looking at how public, the public sector clients use information. Because the, the aim is to make the government and all the public sector clients intelligent users of information. How you provide that information is up to industry to do. But basically, they want to get much smarter in defining what does government sector clients, what do government sector clients want in terms of information from their projects. Uh, the digital plan of work, this is an aligned plan of work for the industry that hooks into BIM stages and BIM activities. And now instead of having something like 30 or so different plans of work across the industry, depending on what se sector you work in or particular niche or institute, there will now be one plan of work. Uh, it's based around the CIC scopes of services and the, um, the APM work stages, if you're familiar with it. COBE, uh, there's lots of guidance on the website about COBE UK 2012 anyway. If, if you're familiar with it, COBE is e essentially an Excel spreadsheet. It's used for exchanging information between BIM models, basically. And uh, co the COBE guidelines tie in with the digital plan of work so that you can get outputs at key stages in the format that you want. Uh, basically, this guidance now extends that and also provides some to tools for producing and evaluating COBE output. Uh, BitPAS 1192 is an extension of uh, BS 1192 2007 which is a work process for BIM environments and common data environments. And basically, PAS 1192 Part 2 is geared towards capital projects. PAS 1192 Part 3, which is starting work this year, it will be geared towards uh, the operational life cycle. Uh, the employer's information requirements uh, ties in with the digital plan of work in that defines what are called the plain language questions 
that a client should ask at key stages to define the information that they want. You know, whether that's a business case at a briefing stage, or whether it's certain key information to inform tender requirements at tender stage, or whether it's um, operational information that they want, you know, sort of asset registers, other sorts of stuff at handover. There's also lots of other stuff. Some interesting guidance produced about uh, professional indemnity and BIM. And basically, for level two, no change. So level three is a different ballpark, but uh, they're starting work on looking at this year. Uh, and also, a key thing is the setting up of the BIM hubs, uh, of which I'm part, which is a way of disseminating and supporting the industry in implementing BIM. Uh, how long have I got, Martin? I haven't even got half my yet. Okay. Uh, uh, PAS 91, this is just to inform public sector procurement. procurement. It, PAS 91 sets the agenda for prequels and tender questions in the public sector. There is a, a, a BIM appendix, and these are the questions that will be coming out in prequels and tenders. Okay, I won't bother with that. Uh, most of you guys will be fairly w familiar what, with what you can do with BIM, so I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, this is very old technology. It isn't new technology. It goes back decades. And it's just that the construction industry is the last of the party. But other industries such as aerospace, petrochem, manufacturing have been doing this for years. And that's a brief timeline of uh, BIM across the world and also uh, in the UK. But again, we won't, we won't waste there. Uh, is this diagram familiar to anybody? Okay, yeah, it usually gets put up in most, it, it, most presentations. It's, it shows the migration across BIM levels, level 0, level 1, level 2. The red line is the UK 2016 target, and this shows a, a migration from effectively um, the stuff that I'm used to, sort of uh, drawing in quill pens on linen, through to CAD, uh, 2D and 3D uh, architectural design. And then level two really is about what's called a federated or composite environment, where we're still designing in disciplines, but we're still amalgamating those models. Level three is a, is a totally integrated environment. Um, and if anybody uh, says they're uh, working in level three BIM to you, just tell them they're talking total BS. Okay, right, uh, we'll move, we'll leave that. Uh, Kobe is just a spreadsheet, and Kobe is just a white, that, that's a Kobe spreadsheet, and that, it is literally an Excel spreadsheet. It's a very big spreadsheet, but it's a way of handling information between BIM models, so for a typical project, you will have a, uh, a 3D geometric model, you'll have some 2D outputs, which are your drawings, and you'll have some Kobe spreadsheets. Uh, UK, um, Kobe UK 2012, which is on the government uh, task group website. There's guidance there, sets out some templates and uh, some examples. Uh, it's just all sorts of information. It could be asset registers, it could be door schedules, it could be manufacturer's information. And you just define how you want it and how you output it, and the Kobe jobs occur at different stages in the process. Um, I think we're sort of moving to a stage where this year, particularly in the UK, uh, and it might be the same over here, um, I think leading uh, BIM innovators will be in the front boat. Uh, and we will see a two-speed in industry starting to develop with this gap. And this comes back to the Darwinian thing. You know, I think there are going to be guys that once, once the guys in the front boat really start to kick into top gear this year, um, and you see it with people like Skanska, BAM, uh, Morgan Sindel, you know, I've seen examples, all sorts of, even some small practices and businesses, they are very BIM efficient. Uh, these guys are doing more with less. You know, they're enhancing their profitability by up to 30%. You know, they're doing it with less resources by 50% on some projects. You know, this begins to open up significant competitive advantage. And the guys in the last boat, how are you going to compete with that? Just slash your prelims? I 
think we need I think we need some more better uh, tactics than that. So so instead of thinking about why why uh, why would you invest in BIM, perhaps the question should be why wouldn't you invest in BIM? Because that's that's where the smart money goes, that's where the smart businesses will be. And you guys up the back there, you'll be in the forefront of this. Because that's really what we've been doing. All these improvement initiatives we've been doing for years and years and years, we've just been trying to do the same things a little better. But BIM and a few other things like lean procurement and lean process offer us the, offer us the opportunity of making a real step change. Uh, the CIB have developed a strategy. Uh, you'll have it on the slides. I'm not going to dwell on it. But it's about people, process, and technology. Technology in terms of BIM is a very small part of the equation. Uh, the key issue is around people and process. And basically, for me, for people in my generation and the in-betweeners, uh, we have all the baggage of doing things the old way. Uh, you guys coming out of college now, you've always done it this way now, the new way. And so you can, you can change the way we work. You can change people's mindsets. You can change our industry. And you, hopefully you won't have these battles to fight that we're fighting at the moment to get people to look at things differently. So this is, this is the CIOB plan uh, for the next three years in terms of BIM in terms of supporting the membership and consultancies and, and businesses. Um, and you're very lucky because you're among the first people to actually see this. Uh, yeah. So in terms of stakeholder BIM, basically it's very simple. Whoever you are, whatever your point in the process, whether you're a client, designer, a contractor, subcontractor, there is a benefit for you using BIM, irrespective of whether other people use BIM or not. So you can do lonely BIM and you will still get some efficiencies and some, uh, make some money out of it. Uh, because it, it will, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Uh, because it, you, you'll get some efficiencies, it really kicks in, the real benefit is on the, on the life cycle and the FM maintenance bits. But even in design and construction, BIM will offer real benefits. Um, some, some, Having done some return on investment studies, the figures actually can be astronomical. We're talking about bigger than 10%. And if, if a client has an estate or a portfolio of projects, even more so. Because the, it leverages the opportunity then of using uh, the BIM environment to leverage efficiency across a portfolio of projects, reusing data and doing all sorts of things. And as we know from a, a, a constructing accident study several years ago by Richard Saxon, um, you might have come across the 15200 ratio. Actually, a more realistic figure is probably 1330. But we're still dealing with big numbers in the operational cycle. If you leverage just 1% improvement on how a building operates, you, save, you can save millions for a client. And that's worth having. So the whole, you know, it changes the focus of the discussion. You know, for, for a long time, we're focusing on the delivery phase, trying to screw some savings out of it. But actually, we should be focusing on design, where we make key, de key decisions, and the operational phase of a building. Because if we, if we can make real savings there, we will, we will save big numbers. And that's where we should be focusing our efforts. So it's before you get to site where you can make the influential decisions because they will affect all this stuff over here. So it's evolution, Bim, but not as we know it, said Jim, or Scott. So the future. Five minutes? Is that open? Yeah, good. Okay, okay that's good. Um, so, so where are we going? See, I, I, on, on, a, on a longer slot, I talk about all this stuff, but just to give you a flavour of where I'm coming from. Uh, this is about much more than BIM. There is a whole raft of things that are impacting our society, uh, 
on a global scale, let alone national or regional. And these affect our industry, they affect the, the buildings we design, they affect the way we build them, they affect the roles that we have in that process. And I believe, uh, really, we're on the brink of something that will radically change our industry. It will radically change the roles that we have. It will change the way we educate and train our professionals of the future. And it will ch eventually, eventually, in time, it will change our institutes and institutions as well. I believe the scale of change that we're on the cusp of is immense. And this is bigger than the first industrial revolution. It sweeps it all away. And I, I, don't, I think very few people realise the scale of the stuff that's going to hit our industry over the next decade. You know, because basically, when you look at these factors, generational change in demographics, in terms of people living longer, uh, the, 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 how that's been affecting economics, pensions, elderly care, all that sort of thing. Training education. You know, people go on about, um, are our graduates fit for practice? You know, how, how is industry supporting graduates? Um, are graduates what industry needs? Are graduates getting the jobs they need? You know, is it, there is a skill shortage. There's a graduate sh shortage. Uh, there's, there's a mismatch in that. In terms of just resources, uh, we're, we're facing challenges both on natural resources and all the resources that we need to do projects. So energy costs are going to go through the roof. Oil production is going to decline. Our economies are built around oil. Uh, but oil is going to get more expensive. It's going to get harder to extract. That's going to have massive implications. You know, sort of, so the way we use energy, you know, what we do, how we get it. Um, I think there's a whole thing around the way, going back to the digital thing, you know, we're connected on a global scale. We trade information every day. We are information traders. Every one of us trade information. Question is, do you want the information that I've got? And are you willing to pay me for it? Because that's the way we've got to think. You know? uh, so there's a sort of convergence between technology and all sorts of things going on. But in a, in a funny sort of way, we're also becoming more fragmented because we're all, all getting into small and smaller niches because you've got to have detailed knowledge of stuff to be valuable. So, so how does that work? I mean, we talked about BIM and technology. Uh, we haven't really talked about climate change, but we've seen the evidence of that already. You know, talk to the people who've been flooded for the third time in the space of 12 months uh, in parts of England. Um, these are supposed to be one in 50 year occurrences. Uh, they're now every year. So what does that mean? You know, how does that change regulations? How does that change the buildings we design? The economic things going on in the, w in the global shift, everything is east. You know, the west is in decline, seriously. You know, our economic model is in trouble. And basically China and India are going to rule the world. So how do we adapt to that? Because basically already the Chinese have already said to David Filk, who's leading the BIM implementation in the UK, if you guys don't make it by 2016, we'll come over and do it for you. And that was serious. So, so the, I've got another presentation which brings this out. That the, however, you know, we, we need a global overview because the threat to us from the east, again, it's like the, the meteorite and the dinosaurs. It could wipe us out. And the demographics I've talked a bit about. There's all these things that are going to impact us, they're going to change us, and we need to respond to survive. Uh, so you can either be sunk by the tidal wave or you can learn to surf it. And I think from a CIOB perspective, we want to help people learn to surf it. Uh, Eddie Tuttle is leading the BIM initiative at the CIOB. You can contact him at Engelmere. Uh, my details are there. Thank you very much.